David Wallace Wells is a best-selling science writer and a New York Times opinion columnist who explores climate change, technology, and the future of the planet and how we live on it. It's an honor to feature the uninhabitable Earth in our book-centered series. It's not often that a book is described as epic-defining, as in geological epic or the Victorian epic. It was described that way in The Guardian. The Washington Post called it this generation's silent spring. We feature all kinds of books in our series, in all genres, poetry, graphic novels, memoir, science writing, journalism. To what genre does this book belong? I would suggest biblical prophecy. <laughs> David Wallace Wells may be the most accomplished living practi practitioner of the alarm call, the urgent message, the vivid warning, the cry in the wilderness, the call to penitence, to reverse our course of action, to mend our ways, and yes, he also foresees the future. He extrapolates data, sound, solid, scientific data to see not our inevitable future, but our inevitable range of futures. The uninhabitable earth is a message to wake us out of our complacency, to shake us out of our paralysis. And if you're skeptical about this comparison and find it too extravagant, it means you haven't read the book. It's a book of fire and flood, pestilence, war, and famine, a book of plagues in abundance. To host this conversation, we're pleased to be joined by Judith Enk. She's the president of Beyond Plastics, an organization working to end single-use plastic pollution. Appointed by President Obama, she served as the regional administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for New York, New Jersey, eight Indian nations, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. She's a professor at Bennington College, where she teaches classes on plastic pollution. You know her as a regular panelist on WAMC's The Roundtable. Please join me in welcoming Judith Ink and David Wallace Wells. Thank you, Mark. I think you have a future with the WBA as a literary sports announcer. I, I was expecting to see Caitlin Clark come galloping <laughs> down next year, all right? So welcome, everyone. What a delight to be here to see all of you, uh, many familiar faces. And I just want to start by thanking David for writing this book. This book tells us irrefutably what we know, but do not really want to know. It is so beautifully written. It is a comprehensive review of scientific knowledge and references. It makes UN climate change reports very exciting in, in the prose. And um, I imagine this was not on a day-to-day -day level, an easy book to write. And I'm reminded um, a few years ago, I bumped into my friend Betsy Colbert, who writes for The New Yorker and who wrote a major book about extinction. And I didn't know she was writing the book. And so I said, so, you know, what are you up to? What's your daily life like? And we had a really long conversation about extinction. And I just kind of backed away and asked her if she needed coffee. So. Tell us just a little bit about your daily writing routine and how, you know, I'm not gonna pre prejudge what you're gonna say, but how you stayed focused and energized given the subject matter. Thank you. Um, two great introductions to be um, humbled by. Um, also, just wanna say it's great to be on stage with you and sharing the stage with you, Judith, so, um, and having conversation with you. Great to be here and speaking with all of you too. Um, you know, I think on some level, the secret of my sanity in writing the book was that I was a newcomer to climate. So I had gone through, I'm born in 1982, I you know, think of myself as a child of the 90s, I spent a lot of my life, spent all of my life aware of climate change, but it never felt so front and center. It didn't feel like the main framework with which I could understand the state of the world or the future. It wasn't the way that I thought about justice, it wasn't the way that I thought about politics, it was sort of off over here. And as a child of the 90s, I also, as much as I knew to discount these intuitions, I had intuitions that 
the world was moving towards the solution of problems and that those that progress wasn't perfect it required mobilization but also on long time scales it felt like something you could count on and i think like a lot of people you know i spent a lot of the last decade decade and a half having a lot of those convictions shaken pretty profoundly and in particular started really waking up to the sort of all-encompassing threat from climate and i was like a convert i was like a zealot i nothing I, you welcome know. <laughs> well i often do feel when i'm when i'm sharing the stage with people like you i feel a little bit like what am i doing up here i'm just like i'm just uh, the, the you know the the johnny come lately but i think as a writer that really helped because it meant that as i was learning about climate everything was new to me Everything was horrifying to me. I hadn't developed any calluses against any of it. I hadn't normalized any of it. And I, aside from maybe like the, you know, the, the ice sheets are gonna melt. That was like the, about what I understood. And the more that I read, the more people I spoke with, the more reports that I dove into, it was like an endless swim through really scary futures. And I felt mainly that what I was doing was just collecting stuff and putting it into a sack. And, you know, I'm a magazine writer. I can write a stylish sentence. And so I was, you know, I wasn't just like cutting and pasting sentences from the IPCC, but I kind of was just cutting and pasting sentences from the IPCC. And the truth is, I think a lot of people found the work really powerful and scary and moving. A lot of that was just seeing all of that information stacked one on top of the other, as though it was the first time, or often because it was the first time, and being confronted with all of it at once, not just about coral reefs, not just about you know, the effect on agriculture, not just the effect of this or that or that, but the whole full scope of it, a planetary story in which we are all affected and our, all of our futures will be transformed. And that's the second part of it that I think was a little bit of the key was that I had a sense of awe, um, almost kind of stonery amazement at like this pure spectacle and scale of the transformation that the world was undergoing and what it meant for all of us to be alive at that moment, watching it change, clocking the change, but also playing a role in determining just how dramatic the changes would be and you know, it sort of embarrasses me to talk in this language, but it is like a mythological or theological experience as a, as a planet, as a people, and to some degree, just as a country. We've pulled the planet from a stable climate to the brink of crisis in the time span of a single generation. And now we have a single generation to do the opposite and stabilize it. That is a superhero movie. Um, and part of, I think, what my book did and what my writing did um, was to communicate that urgency and scale, not just to the people who were baptized in environmental faith, not just to people who um, had spent 20 or 30 or 40 years working on environmental issues and environmental justice, but for people like me who had grown up and spent their whole lives in New York City and thought that nature was happening somewhere else away from them and wouldn't affect them. I felt very much like, oh, it's it's everywhere, it's everything, and I think you know tried to just pour that into the work as much as I could, and you know like I often tell people who are ask ask questions about how I stay sane or how I stay um, calm um, and not collapse into fatalism and d despair, the work of it, the fact that I was turning that turning those lessons and that learning into a product and a project, I think was really important. And it happened in such a compressed way that I almost, in a, such a compressed timeline, that I almost didn't have time to really sit with it until it was already done and behind me. And that's not necessarily a healthy way to be, but it happens to explain how I wrote a full book about it. Very good coping mechanism. Yeah. So I just got an idea. Um, you mentioned, you know, superheroes, etc. Maybe we could get Mark Ruffalo who is a very accomplished environmental activist to do the next, is it Avenger movies? Is that what he does? What, what, you know, yeah. So maybe we could get him to do your book as an Avenger movie. 
maybe. <laughs> I do think that there is something about the the cultural appetite for superhero movies right. um, that tells us that we are all feeling um, anxiety about the fate of the planet. These are stories about groups, small groups of individuals um, holding the fate of the species in their hands. I think there's a reason that we're going through that phase right now. So, I loved Leonardo DiCaprio's movie, Don't Look Up, um, especially the, the, one of the final lines uh, just really stuck with me that right at the end when everything was falling apart, um, I think DiCaprio said, we had it so good. And, um, but that movie didn't really take off the way I thought it would. So we've got to enter the superhero, you well, know. Well, I mean, I mean, I, it's actually the, the writer and director of that is like, is doing a version of my book too, um, Adam McKay. But, um, so maybe I'm biased, but I think that movie was like, for a climate movie, it was like a huge deal. Oh, for a climate <laughs> movie, it was unbelievable. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, th I think like Netflix said it was the most watched movie of the year for them. I um, don't mean to diss it. I just want to <laughs> get it into more mainstream. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's something I write about a little bit in the book is the way in which um, we may also be coping with climate disaster by narrativizing it and that watching movies like that may actually, you know, we often think that they're going to spur more action, but in a certain way it also normalizes it. I wonder about the complicated um, impacts of um, having so much climate fiction, climate movie making, um, I think inevitably we're going to be moving into a world in which there's a lot more of it, and and um, because it's so much, so much a larger part of our, in our lives. But um, I'm not sure that the connection between sort of high-profile storytelling and political engagement is as direct as maybe you and I might like. And I shouldn't have gone off the rails on that one. I just, I just had an idea. Um, my, f my former boss, President Obama, is quoted, this quote is attributed to him, but it's actually Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State, who said, when it comes to climate, we're the first generation to fully understand it and the last generation to, to do something significant to solve it. Now, I noticed you just dropped in the year you were born. That was very hurtful. Um, but at the same time, is this too much pressure on this generation? I mean, that's a pretty uh, substantial charge to make to people who are starting in their lives, who may or may not be having families, who can't afford rent in New York City. Um, and, you know, at the same time, there are amazing groups like Bill McKibben started Third Act, and we still have 350, and we have the Sunrise Movement for students. But what's your sense of, is that just kind of unrealistic to think that this generation is going to fix everything that older folks have really screwed up? Well, I think in the big picture, um, we've already failed that test. Um, you know, the climate is past the point of familiarity. We've left behind the window of temperatures that have been closed all of human history. We've already done that, which means all of us are work walking on a planet that is today warmer than any planet that's ever been walked on by any human ever before. And that everything that we know of as civilization was erected and developed in part on the basis of those climate conditions which we've already left behind. And so a lot of what is to come for all of us is figuring out not just how to limit the amount of future warming, but also figuring out how much of what we take for granted as civilization, wherever that may be and whatever it may mean to us, um, has to be reformed and renovated, how much of it can survive these new conditions, and how much of it has to be discarded. And that is a really heavy task. It's also um, an empowering task to think that um, we are, over the course of you know, a few decades, going to be redesigning all of our energy systems, all of our transportation systems, all of our industry, all of our infrastructure, all of our agriculture. And because we're gonna be doing all that, we probably have to do at least some renovating of our politics too. Um, that can be exciting. Um, so it's, it's both intimidating, um, too much of a burden, and necessary and empowering. 
Um, but when I think about the this sort of the question of generational responsibility, um, for me, it pushes me towards um, a, a kind of firmer commitment to action. I mean, if I were to caricature how I thought about the climate crisis when I was a younger adult or a teenager or something, I did think of it in terms of multiple generations. I thought of it in terms of the Industrial Revolution started in the 18th century in England, came to the US in the 19th century. This is a long project. And I'm here now, and maybe our generation's not taking the right approach or doing enough, but also, like, why is it on me and our generation to fix a problem that is six or eight or 10 generations old? But more than half of all the damage that's ever been done in the history of humanity has been done in the last 25 years, which means it's not an excuse to say they were burning coal in 18th century England. That coal doesn't matter compared to what America is burning right now. Um, and, or it matters equally as much and the timeline is not um, an alibi. And you know, it's, it's been a quarter of all that damage has been since Joe Biden was elected vice president, since 2008. When Obama taking the nomination said, this is the moment that the, we're gonna look back on this, the moment that the seas stopped their rise and the planet began to heal. Since that time, we've done one quarter of all the damage that's ever been done. And in the timeline of almost everyone alive today, we're talking about, you know, um, James Lovelock recently died. He was alive for like 95% of all the <laughs> damage that's ever been done to the history of the planet, uh, to the future of the planet through carbon. So, you know, this is not something that someone else dumped on our plate. Um, you know, for someone who's a teenager, maybe in their 20s, it's a little bit of that. But even for them, I would say, we're still setting records every year with carbon emissions. So we're, we're still creating more problems every single year than in any previous year in human history. And so we really shouldn't think of this looking backward as a, you know, a generational, a problem of generational justice and with us having to clean up the mess of previous generations. We should be thinking of it in terms of general, generational justice going forward and that we have the opportunity to improve the lives, not just of the next generation, but literally millennia of um, future humanity. And as I say, you know, it's certainly reasonable to look at that as a, as a burden that's quite large and um, emotionally taxing to, to, to take on and process. But personally, I think it's better and just sort of more res being a more responsible citizen and steward um, to think of what a privilege, you know, Thank God we're alive now, and not 50 years from now when things are even worse. Um, thank God we're alive now with the opportunity to really reshape the trajectory of the whole planet, by which I don't just mean climate, but everything that comes from climate. We have that power. We are in that position. That is the story that we are living in. That is the story we are writing, and we're going to be writing it whether we like it or not, so better to take an active role and write a happy story or a relatively happy one rather than sitting by the sidelines and watching a worse future unfold. Good. So in the book, you point out that half of the carbon emitted into the atmosphere has been emitted in the last three decades. So we have emitted as much with full knowledge of the destructive consequences as we did in two centuries of ignorance, really, in terms of the impacts. Many of these polluting facilities are located in low-income communities and communities of color, uh, where are coal plants and fracked gas plants and oil plants sited, typically in low-income communities, communities of color, often known as environmental justice communities. And then in a terrible, painful irony, it's these same communities that are so hard hit by more intense hurricanes, rising sea level, um, incredible heat in the summer. And even if someone has an air conditioner, it's expensive to run it. Um, I mean, there are major cities that are just uninhabitable in, in the summertime and around the globe, more than just the summertime. 
So talk to us a little bit about your views on the environmental justice implications of solving or not solving the climate crisis. Yeah, I'm increasingly I think that this is the lens with which we should view this more than the um, the way I've written in the past and talked about it as a sort of a universal fate. I think that the fates that we face on the planet through climate change are very differential and that the differences matter an enormous amount. Um, I just a, a quick aside about the description you, you offered about the, you know, the people who are um, forced to live near polluting facilities and facing the dangers. Um, among other things, that reveals that while we told ourselves we didn't know about these things, we kind of did know about them because we forced the least privileged people to live in the, in the face of hurricanes, in the face of floods, and you know, um, on some level we knew that they were vulnerable to, to, um, to climate impacts all along. Otherwise, those would not have been the places where the poorest um, and least powerful people lived. Um, so you can think about this challenge on almost any level, you know, at the local level, within a particular community, um, the people who are living in the face of climate impacts are likely to be the least advantaged. Within a nation, it's the same. But personally, I think mostly about it on the international scale. And there I see just absolutely, um, I don't even know the language <laughs> to use. It is a complete indictment of the world system that we inhabit today um, that the United States as a country has produced 25 times as much carbon emissions, put 25 times as much carbon into the atmosphere than all of Sub-Saharan Africa. The country, it's a region of 800 to 900 million people. Um, probably 500, 600 million of them don't have electricity. Um, and they are already today among the hardest hit um, places in the world, such that you know there are all these fancy economic analyses of the future impacts of, of climate change. Studies showing that um, Sub-Saharan Africa, 20 to 25% poorer today than it would be without the impacts of climate change. These are not places that can afford to be 20 or 25% poorer. Um, you think about the impacts in India, um, probably in many ways more intense even than the impacts in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they're you know, across large parts of the country in just a few decades. There'll be weeks or even months of the year when going outside or working outside risks heat stroke or possibly heat death. Um, that's true across the Middle East as well. But um, you know, in India is facing environmental challenges beyond just climate um, in India because of air pollution, the average life expectancy across the whole country um, is six or seven years shorter than it would be without air pollution. In across the Gangetic Plain and in Delhi, um, it's something like 10 or 11 years shorter, which means this is like Delhi is a city of 25 million people. Every single one of them is living a decade shorter than they would if it were not for the air pollution. Um, everyone is breathing there. Something like half of the kids in Delhi are, have some kind of pulmonary disease. Um, so. You know, we have unbelievable yawning gaps between um, the future that is being faced by the people with the least and the future that will be navigated um, somewhat more successfully by people in the world with the most. And it's, you know, the on some level, the, it's like an ugly, you can call it an ugly irony. I actually think it's sort of just a revealed portrait of the um, power dynamics of the world as it exists, um, but it's, you know, the people who are doing this damage, the places that are doing this damage, are, um, are not at all the people facing the problem. And um, I used to think, you know, I used to think that the, we, were on, we were on spaceship Earth, we all had responsibility to one another, and I used to like to think that climate change might teach us to be better brothers and sisters to one another to really take seriously the humanity of one another, no matter how far, because we were all facing the same set of challenges. But the more that I understand about the differential impacts um, coming our way, the more I understand that um, we're gonna be living in very different climate futures, depending on where we live. And unfortunately, I think one of the main ways that we will cope with that fact in places like the US 
is to kind of turn our backs on people living in the face of more intense climate disasters already. I think we're doing that already. Um, you know, we're not talking about the fact that, you know, the heat wave that just swept across the Sahel um, was so climate powered, or we talk about, you know, dam broken Libya because of a, a major storm. Um, more than a thousand people were killed, the deadliest flood in the century anywhere in the world. And American commentators are like, oh, it's because they didn't repair their dam. And not, they don't think, oh, it's because climate change made that flood 50% worse. Now, both things are true. They could have done better work on that dam. Also, we could have helped them do better work on that dam and made it so that it was less likely to flood. Um, but we're not doing any of that. I mean, the, the amount of money that's been promised to the developing world to deal with climate change in the form of adaptation um, is, I mean, we've, we've met like a tiny fraction of that, um, of that promise. And I, yeah, I, I, I go to sleep every night really thinking about how much we've failed our moral obligations to um, the least developed parts of the world, um, the people who are facing the toughest climate impacts and um, all of whom deserve much more attention and support um, than the Global North has managed to provide them. Thank you. So when I go to a bookstore and look at books, I, I read the little summary of what it's about. And then I read the blurbs, because I love reading the blurbs. And then I read the, the chapter titles. And if I were to read your chapter titles, um, particularly in the second part of the book, Elements of Chaos, on page 43, there's heat death, followed by hunger, drowning, wildfire, disasters no longer natural, freshwater drain, dying oceans. So David, when you go to a party, <laughs> is there anyone other than your mother who comes running over and wants to talk to you? Um, I like parties. Um, I have a good time at party. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of people think about this book in those terms, which is to say, like, as a it's a um, a collection of um, really scary predictions about the future, um, all of which come from science, but which are gathered in one place and can be quite overwhelming to contemplate. That's the sort of that's the uninhabitable Earth part of the title. But I always like to say the subtitle is Life After Warming. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to do in setting up that, um, that litany is to say, um, we're gonna be living in that future and on that world. Um, we're not gonna be extinguished. We're not gonna be brought extinct. The question climate change ultimately asks us is not an existential one in the sense of will we make it? It's an existential one in the sense of what will we make of it? What will we do in that world? If agriculture is harder to come by and food prices are more expensive and hunger is much more widespread as a result, what will those of us who have the means to do so do about it? How will we show ourselves in that challenge? If conflict is more pervasive as the science shows that it likely will be if it isn't already, what will we do about that? Will we stand by and look at the coup belt that's emerged across the Sahel in Africa, where we've had 14 coups in seven years and you can walk all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, just, sorry, in seven countries in five years, you can walk all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, just through countries that have had coups in the last five years. Will we look at that and say, we need to pay attention here, we need to do something, or will we look away and say, oh, that's just Africa. And you can do that for every single one of the um, impacts we talked about. When, when we imagine as Americans or people in the global north, when we imagine the poverty of South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, do we think to ourselves 20% of that is the result of climate change that we caused? Or do we think that's just the way that life is there? These are really, really profound questions that climate change asks of all of us. And I think ultimately, you know, it's on us in this generation to answer them in a better, more hopeful, more humane way than previous generations have asked. Um, but you know, that's only one way of answering your question. <laughs> Another more direct way is to say, um, 
some version of what I said earlier, which is this is all scary. It's also really dramatic. Um, and we can run and hide from this saga. We can, we can pretend that it's not happening or live our lives as though it isn't. Or we can feel drawn and elected and um, drafted into a struggle that's much bigger than ourselves in which the lives of many, many people will be shaped and determined and in which we happen to be lucky enough to have the opportunity to play a pivotal role. Um, so, you know, whether people want to hear that from me at parties, I mean, I can also talk about Seinfeld if you want. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, that there is a, I think that there is a way in which the bleakness is also um, empowering, emboldening, and ultimately um, enlargening. And I didn't invent the, the doom label for you. You've heard this before. But I also want to point out on page 35 of your book, you're facing the future with your eyes wide open, and you're urging us to do the same. You write in your book, the fight is definitely not yet lost. In fact, will never be lost so long as we avoid extinction, because however warm the planet gets, it will always be the case that the decade that follows could contain more suffering or less. So that is quite the clarion call and also leads me to the world of politics. Um, so there's the first president in the history of the United States has gone on trial this week in Manhattan in a criminal case. Um, we'll see what the outcome is there. Um, and you did point out that while I think the Biden environmental record is measurably better than the guy before him. There is still some real disappointment, particularly drilling on public land, and people are surprised to, to learn about that record. Um, but what do we do if Trump wins in November? What do we do on the climate issue? I mean, I, what do you, you should, I, I'll ask you at the, when, I, when I'm done. I have no idea. <laughs> um, no, I do, but I want to hear from you. Well, I would say a few things. I would say, um, I think that the, um, the green transit, the economics of the green transition matter a lot here. And that um, Trump has plans, um, you know, he has plans to do a lot of shit is a lot, plans to do a lot of shit about climate too. Um, we'll see whether that comes to pass if he is elected or if it sort of falls by the wayside or runs up against obstacles like um, many of the similar initiatives um, did in the first term. But I think, um, you know, there's a lot going on even in the US that means that um, green energy is going to proceed at some rate um, going forward, and the question is about speed and scale and how much more we can do based on um, where we are today. But just now, already, we're seeing um, states that report, you know, as much as 80, 90 percent of a full year's renewable, a few full year's electricity generation coming from renewable sources, even in places that we imagine as being like dyed red, dyed red states, like soaked in fossil fuel, like Texas have had incredible rollouts of green energy um, over the last few years. In fact, in Texas, it saved them from blackouts on a couple of occasions already. And when conservative Republicans in the state legislature tried to um, pass some bills a year ago to kneecap green energy in the state, they actually got pushback from other Republicans who said, no, we know that doing this would cost our, um, cost our voters um, a lot of money in their bills. We're not gonna do that. Already, I think there's, a that kind of momentum, even in a place like Texas, and um, which tells you, I think, that it's happening in many parts of the country. And I do think that that's one of the subterranean, sort of underappreciated stories of the post-IRA um, landscape, like after the big climate bill that Biden passed. Um, Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, I think in some, way, some ways an unfortunate term, named bill because like nobody knows that it has to do with climate, but um, it is probably why Joe, Joe Manchin voted for it. So I guess we have to take the good with the bad. Um, but you know, I think I think basically um, you know this has led to a huge manufacturing boom, uh, employment boom. It's only going to get bigger, 
And I don't think that there's all that much stopping it. When Trump came into office the first time, he tried to reopen coal plants. It basically didn't work because the economics of coal plants were dead at that point in the US. Um, and I think there's something similar going on with the green energy transition here. Um, what worries me is less rollbacks and more roadblocks. Um, and I think that there are a lot of areas in the US where we need to be making much more progress. I think we're doing an okay job on energy. We need to be doing more on transportation because we have the tech there to really move the needle and we're not moving nearly as fast as other countries in the world. But then especially when we get into heavy industry and agriculture and infrastructure, these are areas where the US needs to be doing a lot more, needs a lot more public attention and focus, and I think that we will get absolutely none of it in a, um, in a Trump second term. Um, at the global scale, I think the story is more like the first one I told though, that um, there are political road bumps, you know, um, there are things, things are getting um, reversed and rolled back and subsidies are getting withdrawn. And nevertheless, I think um, we're seeing, you know, in the big picture, some real movement that is, in terms of the direction of change, unstoppable. The question is how fast it happens, um, how quickly we get all the way to, um, to zero. Um, and I don't know ultimately how much a Trump presidency will affect that geopolitical landscape for climate. Um, you know, I, I think it's better to have unanimity in the commitments of global leaders. I think you don't want someone who's kind of a half denier to have the White House. Um, but I also don't think it's like why China is building half the world's renewable capacity right now. It's not because Joe Biden's in the White House. Um, they're not producing 80 plus percent of the world's solar panels because Joe Biden's in the White House. Um, and they're gonna keep doing that whether whoever's in the White House in two years. Um, so it's a scary election. There's an enormous amount at stake, including um, I think a lot of people's basic faith in the decency of the country and the possibility of a good future. Um, but sometimes I find myself thinking that there may be less hanging on it climate-wise than we think, and that a lot of um, a lot of progress will unfold no matter who's um, in the executive seat. But that might be naive or deluded or wishful thinking because I'm trying to cope with the possibility that um, that that may happen. Thanks. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to go to the audience. I have so many more, but I'm just going to ask one. So David, on page 166 of your book, you refer to plastics as a climate red herring. And you say that plastic panic stems from an admirable desire to leave a smaller imprint on the planet. And your reasoning is that plastic pollution is simply not a global, global problem. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um. Yeah, I think, I think that that's uh, definitely not a series of sentences that I would write today. Um, and I've thought a lot more about, um, when I wrote the book, I really did think that um, climate was the umbrella story and everything else fit into it. And by that, I don't just mean other environmental issues. I mean every political, social issue. And um, I think I've, I've moved a little bit on that in the years since and think a lot more about um, a lot of the other environmental challenges, um, you know, biodiversity loss, pollution in general. And I may well write a next book about environmental contamination and, and, um, and the pollution crisis more generally. Um, plastics are, you know, I think I'd, I would emphasize now, um, are also a fossil fuel, basically. <laughs> um, and it's actually one of the ways that the fossil fuel industry is sort of trying to engineer a future for itself in a post-fossil fuel world is by manufacturing considerably more um, plastics. Um, the particular like carbon footprint analysis of like whether it makes sense to have a plastic bag or a, a, a you know a, a paper bag, I think the, the studies seem to me to be like really all over the place. But I think that the um, the undeniable fact of plastics pervasive penetration of our environment everywhere in the world is unbelievably harrowing. We don't really know what it means for our health yet, but we know it can't be good. And we also think 
I think maybe most profoundly know now that we can't escape it. I mean, they found microplastics in, you know, Arctic snow, in fresh raindrops in the Amazon. They found them on the inside of um, placentas. They found them in mother's milk. I mean, this is like, if you cut open your flesh, there is plastic in it now. And we have not yet begun to think, I think in a profound or deep way about what it means to be moving through the world, moving through a world that is also a contagion field um, without sort of, you know, I think we, many of us fall back on the, on the reflex of being like, how can I escape this? How can I get away from this plastic pollution? How can I get away from this air pollution? How can I get away from this smoke? How can I get away from this lead? How can I get away from these forever chemicals? And you know, you can do that to some extent in some cases, but I think more profoundly, you kind of can't do that. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that these are big issues. They mean a lot to people. And I think even though they mean a lot to people, we are really early in thinking about what they mean for us as a, as a species and a culture. And um, it's something we need to be, and me included, spend a lot more time thinking about it. I know you spent a lot of time thinking about it yourself, but. Um, you knew this question was coming. <laughs> I actually didn't, but this, is, this, is, this does map like one of the changes in my perspective over the last five years, which is like, I really did think, um, let's just focus on global temperature rise. Like that is the thing. And, um, you know, first of all, that's more complicated than it sounds, but also, um, we are living in many ways already in a post-apocalyptic world. Um, you know, 70% of insects possibly have died. 70% of mammal species um, are in decline. 90% of large mammals, of the large animals that used to occupy the upper ocean are already dead. Um, you know, I mentioned at the event earlier today, I think the figure is that 96% of all um, mammals by weight on Earth are humans and their livestock. Um, we have completely remade the planet that we inherited. You know, we know that like we're living in the end of nature, um, but sometimes when we think about climate change, we imagine an apocalypse to come without really thinking about what it means that we are already living through one or have already lived past one and are now trying to navigate a deformed, degraded, burned over world. Um, and those questions about what we do with the world we have now are just as important as the questions we might ask about the world that we're building for the future. And I think biodiversity, ecosystem loss, um, you know, pollution crisis, all of these are really big parts of that challenge and dilemma. I do hope it's your next book. Excellent. So let's open the open to questions. Just um, identify yourself and speak yeah. If you raise your hand and and I'll bring you the microphone, please ask your question very succinctly so we can get to as many questions as possible. So I can be as long-winded in my answers as possible. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We just saw the other day a women's group in Sweden, I think, sued the government for not moving deliberately enough or fast enough. Are these the kind of things that? we hope to see to help some change uh, occur closer, quicker, I mean. Yeah, I was just walking, talking about this on the way in. Um, I've been really, I mean, I've been amazed and impressed at the pace of change on climate across the board since I started writing about it. When I started writing, I wrote my first big article about um, worst case scenarios in 2017, so that's you know six, seven years ago now. I think it was fair to say then that at the global level, we've been talking about climate change for a very long time and not really doing much. Um, and for a lot of reasons, that's no longer fair to say. We've had a global climate awakening in the form of protest movements. We've had the, the end of climate denial, at least as it's practiced by global leaders in an explicit way. We've had serious commitments and investments. You know, Renewable technologies are getting much cheaper for all of these reasons. We're in a very different and in some ways a better position than I thought we would be in today. Um, but the litigation um, and sort of climate law part of that story is not insignificant. There have been over the last few years a handful of really high profile judgments um, all across the world. Um, 
on questions of environmental justice and, and climate justice, um, judgments against oil, oil and gas companies, but also judgments against governments, um, lawsuits brought by young people, lawsuits brought by old people. Um, and I've been surprised and impressed at how quickly and deeply that movement has really taken hold. I think it's not totally clear, certainly in each individual case, but even at the collective level, what these judgments mean practically, what it means for something to be legally binding um, if there isn't you know, an entity that's capable or willing or interested in enforcing it. Um, the question applies to, to even legally binding decarbonization targets that a lot of countries have passed. Um, but it's still a sign of some progress um, that high courts in many countries of the world have decided to uphold these very basic principles that the role of governments, one job of governments and one set of rights for people is that the world should be preserved for their benefit and the benefit of future generations and not destroyed in the short term um, for the profits of a few com companies. Um, as I say, you know, practically speaking, I think most of these judgments haven't amounted to much yet. Um, and the, the ultimate future and ultimate legacy of those is unclear. But it's certainly better to see those judgments having been made than to see them um, not having been made. And ultimately, I think even, we think of the courts and the legal system as this sort of like extra political um, universe where you know judges decide behind benches, um, but you know these are political systems too. They're susceptible to public pressure, and I think one of the things that is, explains some of this movement um, is that so many more people are have been out in the streets and have been rallying, and and um, so many more activists have been called to action over the last five or ten years. Um, I hope that continues. I worry a little bit about the sort of the level of energy in the climate protest movement right now. It seems to me to be a little lower than a few years ago, pre-pandemic, but um, hopefully it's still having an impact, not just on political leadership of the world, but also um, you know, the, the legal authorities too. I'm next. Hi, thanks for your book. I'm thinking about the people who won't read a book, but will watch TV and wondering how, what you think about the accuracy of the show Extrapolations. Um, I haven't watched it, so I can't say in detail. Um, it seems to me like the, um, the folks who did it drew on and worked with a number of people who know. Um, but in general, I think that we shouldn't always be, um, we shouldn't hold speculative work to the standard of science and should feel comfortable that um, storytellers do work that may depart from what we know. The Twilight Zone is not powerful because it's accurate. The Twilight Zone is powerful because it speaks to our fears. And I think that um, people doing storytelling around climate should, should lean into that as opposed to lean away from it. Um, in general, I mean, I was talking about this a little bit earlier, but in general, I think that we, I wrote, about, I wrote about this in the book in a sort of predictive sense, but I think we've seen it already, that climate anxiety and climate concerns have become a much bigger part of pop culture over the last few years. Um, and what it means for us as like climate actors, I don't know. I think the, the impact is somewhat ambiguous. Um, and I do worry a little bit that like seeing visions of apocalypse on our TV every night will make us feel better about the world that we're inhabiting, not worse. Um, and normalize disasters that we see unfolding in the real world by reference and comparison to things that we've seen um, on screen. That's not to say I'm opposed to this stuff. I think it's natural and inevitable that people living through changes of this scale will try to narrativize it in a variety of ways, including apocalyptic ways. Um, but I also don't know that the issue, the main issue that we're dealing with is awareness or, um, I mean, I don't think most people are as alarmed as they should be, but you know, I, I think, um, I don't, when I think about why we're moving too slowly now, I don't think 
oh, people don't know about climate change or people don't know that it could be bad. I think most people do know about climate change and most people know that it could be bad. I think there are other obstacles that are standing in our way. And um, sort of Hollywood storytelling may not be all that useful to like explain or help break the holds that our sort of status quo um, systems of political economy have on um, uh, have on us. Like, if you know our dependence on fossil fuels makes it really hard, not just at an individual level but at a political level, to break away from them, um, I think the challenges there are, yeah, more political and cultural. Um. Hi. <laughs> So you've been talking a lot about like solutions, but I think you've been talking about them on a very like institutional political level. What do you think like just the average person could be doing to like be bettering themselves to help better the environment? Well, you know, the, the simple answer is like if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, the the three big things that you can do is to um, drive an electric car if you're going to have a car, not fly, and don't eat beef. Those are like the three big things. Um, but I think we've, we often fall into a trap as people who worry about the environment um, in, in using um, those facts or, or the fact that we do control to some extent um, the amount of carbon that we put into the world as a test to tell one another that we're not good enough climate actors. And you, know, you hear all the time from the kind of climate that you know the right wing that like someone like Al Gore is like a climate hypocrite because he flies on a on a on a um, on a jet to go from place to place or Leonardo DiCaprio or whatever, but you know we, it's hard to be Greta Thunberg and take a boat from Sweden to New York. Um, I mean I admire her for that among many other things she's done, but it's hard, and I think that we should rethink our relationship to what is often called hypocrisy because um, I think what gets called hypocrisy that is the gap between the way we're living and the way we want to live, that is a gap that describes political ambition, not personal failing. We all want to be better together than we are as individuals. That's why we get together as collectives. And that's good. Like, that's what society is for. We don't ask people to donate all of their income before we take them seriously advocating for a tax hike. We just don't. <laughs> Like, we don't say, if you want more money spent on schools, why aren't you donating to the school? It's a perfectly legitimate thing to say, as a collective, we should be channeling more resources in this direction. And ultimately, the challenge of climate is, I think, that scale of challenge, political challenge, social challenge. How you engage with that differs from person to person. And it is a form of political engagement just to be talking about the issue and worrying about it with the people around you. There are a lot of polls showing that many more people carry climate anxiety around than talk about it. And so it's kind of empowering, liberating to discuss it. It also creates a natural network. You may build upon that politically. You may want to do more than that. You want to, may want to vote for local elections or national elections, chiefly on climate basis. You might want to call your representatives and give them a hard time about climate. You might want to protest. You might want to join a group. All of those things are, for me, much more important than whether you are vegetarian or whether you avoided plane travel over the last year. Because all of these challenges are just too big to solve as individuals. Like, we could all in this room go vegan tomorrow. Everybody in New York State could go vegan tomorrow. Everybody in America could go vegan tomorrow. Everybody in the global north could go vegan tomorrow. We would still not have solved the agriculture, the problem of carbon emissions from agriculture, which requires some much more systematic approach. And even more so, that goes for things like plane travel and, and cars. Like, if you can't charge your car, if there isn't a charging station for your EV, or if the place where you can charge your EV gets its power from a coal plant, there's only so much you can do. But I, as an individual, can't decide whether there's a coal plant in my town or whether there's a charging station in my town, except through politics. And I can't decide whether a plane is you know flying on clean fuel or cleaner fuel i mean no plane is going to do that today but i can't decide if a plane in 2035 or 2040 is flying on clean fuel except through some amount of politics r d carbon pricing that forces 
um, development of those fuels. And so when we're talking about a planetary scale challenge, the solutions have to be planetary too. And that means political, which means that our contributions as individuals, I think, are primarily through our capacities as political actors rather than as consumers, which is sort of what our culture tells us, even though it's a pretty toxic lesson, that we make our mark on the world politically by what we buy rather than how we act. And in fact, we need to be much, much more committed to action and much less concerned about like what we buy in the supermarket or the clothing store and what its carbon footprint is. I love so that answer. We've got uh, two more questions, the last two, I think. Uh, one here and, and Aaron will have the last question. Is that good? And then I have one final yes, wrap up. Of yep. course. So two more questions. Yes. Hi. Um, I come to a lot of talks and um, rarely is the aerosol effect or global dimming um, addressed. Um, so I'm asking you, uh, possibly you can explain that in, to the folks here and, and how threatened are you by that? Yeah, um, I actually read about it in the book and I've written about a few other pieces about it too. So it's something that's on my mind very much. In, in short, I mentioned the pervasiveness of air pollution um, just to give people a sense of scale. Um, 10 million people are dying every year globally prematurely from, the, from air pollution, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels. 10 million people every year. But that pollution is not just killing us, it's also cooling us because a large chunk of what happens when we burn fossil fuels is stuff gets put up into the atmosphere that actually reflects sunlight back into outer space that would otherwise be absorbed by the planet. And so we have for a very long time, as we've been burning fossil fuels, we've also been suspending what are essentially you know, reflective particles into the atmosphere. And as a result, the planet is considerably cooler than it would be if we didn't have that pollution, which again is killing 10 million people a year. So of course we want to get rid of it. What's the cost of getting rid of it? The scientific estimates are pretty they vary a lot. There's a lot of uncertainty about this. We haven't studied it nearly as much. The median estimate from the IPCC is that it is cooling the planet by about a half a degree of warming, which means if we snapped our fingers tomorrow and all of that pollution fell out of the sky, we would be due for another half degree of warming from what we have today. Now, most scientists and modelers will tell you that's not how it's going to happen. We're also drawing down methane, and it's very complicated the way the physics of all of this works, but it's not like we're due for a huge bump. Probably, if we get if we decarbonize rapidly, we will be able to offset the effect of um, of aerosol warming with cooling from the reduction of methane, and it basically offsets. But I said probably, and the scary thing is that we don't entirely know, in part because we don't entirely know how large that aerosol effect is. And some very prominent climate scientists, including basically the most prominent, James Hansen. Um, thinks that this is a much bigger deal than the conventional science suggests, and that we are due for a, a larger acceleration of warming, and ultimately something like a, a, a jump um, over the next couple of decades, because we are well on our way to drawing down um, aerosol pollution at the global level. In certain places, it's getting worse, but at the global level, it's getting better, and probably will continue to get better. What that means, practically, for temperature rise is I think more temperature rise probably. We're at, depending on how you want to measure, you know, on the 30 year average, we're at about 1.1 degrees of warming. On the one year average, we're at about 1.6 degrees of warming. Um, we want to stay below two. We had thought we might want to stay below 1.5. Sorry if all these numbers mean nothing to you. But um, basically, we, we blew past the, we've already blown past the, the, the safe zone. We're into a zone of uncertainty and danger and we still have time to save ourselves from, from some truly extreme scenarios. The drawdown of aerosols makes um, all of those goals harder to achieve. Um, it also has a really dramatic and profound regional effect. And when we often talk about the impacts of climate change at the global level in terms of global average temperature, um, you know, what happens to one particular area when aerosols change is a very active area of science and it seems to be quite significant. So you've had, I mentioned earlier, the Sahel and the political instability in the Sahel. They had a huge um, hunger crisis starting in the 1970s and 1980s across the Sahel, which most scientists now believe was due to the reduction of aerosols in Europe, 
um, that happened in parallel with our Clean Air Act. So that kind of thing, it can shift rain belts, it can shift agricultural patterns, even independent of its effect on, on global average temperature. So I think we're, you know, we're running a really big experiment here with aerosols. We don't really know what they've done to cool the planet. We don't really know how much they have shaped um, all of these other weather dynamics um, at the regional level. Um, and we're gonna find out. And that's quite scary. And that's just another, I mean, I would say the same thing about the climate thing in general. It's like, that's another way of thinking about the next few decades is, in addition to the moral test that I've talked about and the political test, we're also just running a science experiment. And almost nothing that scientists have published on climate science over the last 50, 70 years is known. It's all quite speculative. Now, they've been very good. The predictions they made 70 years ago have been like, you know, that's exactly how we, we follow the curve exactly. We, yeah, including scientists at Exxon, who did this maybe earlier and better than many um, other scientists. But, you know, on a lot of more local questions, like how fast Arctic ice or Antarctic ice is gonna disappear, on the effects on the Amazon, on um, effects on agriculture, um, relative frequency of droughts or, or, or floods in particular areas of the world, there's a much bigger uncertainty bar. We can say with some confidence, like we know the direction of change, we know it, like it's, is this gonna get drier or wetter, but exactly the scale of the intensity is quite open-ended. And as humans, we've processed that uncertainty at the level of each individual impact and at the global impact, kind of as an excuse for inaction. And we've thought, well, maybe it won't be that bad. If, we, if there's so much we don't know, maybe it won't be that bad. But of course, the responsible response is to say, let's think about what it would mean if it was gonna be as bad as it could get and try to avoid that and prepare for it. And um, on both of those fronts, avoiding it and preparing for it, we're not doing nearly enough, even for the median outcomes and certainly for some of the kind of uh, more worrying extreme outcomes, including those that could be accelerated by, um, by the aerosol effect. Your thoughts on longstanding intellectual scientists and thought leaders like Michael Mann, who, by the way, has been vindicated with regards to the hockey stick curve, uh, and also winning some key uh, defamation lawsuits against uh, climate deniers. But I find it very curious at this particular point, uh, where clearly we were blown, blown past 1.5 degrees Celsius and we're rapidly going to that 2 degrees Celsius and the physics behind and what that means for the cryosphere. But yet he's taken a position of a lot of very other scientists and in, in pushing back calling it climate doomerism. I mean, hearing it come from him that where we should have, I think, really more than just a healthy, uh, uh, deep concern, but we should be expressing it. I mean, we've been pushing back against the denialists, but it seems that somebody like a man uh, should be speaking and banging it with a deeper sense of urgency than what he's been pushing back publicly. Your thought on scientists right now who are actually now pitching against allies and calling us, saying our interpretations of the IPCC report borders on that climate doomerism and we need to take a step back. Things are not that bad. Um, well, I don't want to make it too much about Michael Mann. Um, I have a complicated relationship with him, but um, you know, in the, in the big picture, there are, there are a few different things I think are worth talking about in your question, which I think is very important. Um, one is a question of the state of the science and what do we know? Um, is global warming accelerating? Is it accelerating beyond what was predicted? predicted? Um, where does that leave us? Then there's also the question of how people relate to that news, how people tell the story. Um, and then there's um, the question of what it means for the way that we're gonna live on this planet, right? So I'll try to do each of those in turn. Um, we've seen over the last two years a pretty dramatic increase in um, almost every measure of of climate change and global warming um, at the local level, at the regional level, at the global level. Um, almost no science scientist predicted this would happen, even though it is also in some large degree powered by the ENSO cycle, the El Nino, La Nina cycle um, in the Pacific. But the scale of the, uh, of the jump up is much larger than almost anyone predicted or projected. And that's why over the last year, we have been well above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And there've been a few days that were above two degrees Celsius of warming. Um, basically nobody thought that um, jumps of that scale were, were likely if you had polled them two years ago. Scientists will also say that nevertheless, 
that jump in temperature is, at least for now, within the boundaries of the uncertainty range of most of these projections, which is to say, it looks like by most measures, not in all of these measures, but certainly at the global average temperature level, we are at the high end of what was seen to be possible, not beyond what was thought to be possible. And so different scientists look at that set of facts and say different things. Some say, we don't understand why it's gotten so hot this year. That's true. Some say, this is an unprecedented spike in global temperatures. That's true. And some say, it's still within the envelope of possibilities that we projected five years ago. And that's also true. Um, you know, my view of the data says that the rate of warming has undeniably accelerated. Um, compared to what was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Um, at what rate or how you want to draw that curve can give you different, you know, you can get slightly different measures and it's like, did, have we seen a 50% increase? Have we seen a doubling in the rate of warming? Um, unclear, different people I think differ on that, but certainly the greenhouse effect as measured by um, Earth's energy imbalance is getting stronger and as a result, the planet's heating up. Um, there are also some indications that some carbon sinks um, are weakening and we may be seeing some effect there. So on the question of where we are today and whether it makes sense to say it's worse than we think or not, um, uh, well, first of all, who's we, right? Like most of the public um, didn't have an understanding of the, the uncertainty range of the IPCC projections for temperatures in 2023. So for most of the world, you can say, Oh, it got, it got hotter than anybody expected this year. That's big news and bad news. Um, whether it disproves or undermines like the conventional scientific community and their projections, I think we have to say it doesn't because the temperatures that we've seen are contained within that range. Um, but it may well be the case that five years from now, we're, what we're seeing is the beginning of a trend that pulls us out of that range. That's what Jim Hansen thinks. It's not what Michael Mann thinks. We'll see, it's an experiment. Um, you know, adjudicating their relative expertise is kind of a, a fool's game. Um, personally, I'm, I'm more inclined to see things like Jim does, but um, that's not to say that I know for sure that that's happening, I think. And he wouldn't say, really, that he knows for sure it's happening. So that's the state of the science. We don't really know whether we're in the middle of an accelerating period, or we don't know how fast things are accelerating, I should say. Um, then there's the question of what sense we make of that and what story we tell. And here is really um, where I take more issue with those criticizing doomerism. And what I mean by that is I simply, I look out at the world. I do not see people en masse who have given up on climate change. I see people not caring enough. I don't think there's any denying that. The number of people who think the world's gonna end and the climate is spiraling out of control, it's just not a mass number. If it was, we would see huge riots. We would see a whole different kind of political energy than we've seen. Um, there are people who tell pollsters that they are worried about whether humanity can survive over the next few decades. That is not the same thing as really feeling the world is gonna end from climate change. I do not see any meaningful sign that true climate doomerism is a mass phenomenon in the world among kids, which is about whom it's often said, about people who've been in the movement for a long time, for whom there may burnout may be some issue. At any level, in any corner, I see a world that is still not doing enough, that is not concerned enough, that is not worried enough. Now, do I think that some apocalyptic messaging could turn some people away? I think it's possible. But I think if you look at the last five years and the way that rhetoric like Greta's, like the climate strikers, like Extinction Rebellion, like Sunrise, like the rhetoric of these people has been incredibly urgent and has been called apocalyptic and doomerous, doomerish, but it has worked. Those protests grew and grew and grew. They drew people into the streets. They drew them into the streets, not just in places like Stockholm or Paris or London. They drew people into the streets in Nairobi. They drew people into the streets in Delhi by the millions. That is, to me, the thing to focus on, that we have turned up the dial 
the, on climate rhetoric over the last five years, and we are living in a new political reality when it comes to climate action as a result. That's not to say that the only way to talk about climate change is, you know, we've got whatever it is now, six years to save the planet. Um, there are a variety of ways to talk about it. Different people are gonna come to the issue in their own terms. Everybody's gonna meet, you know, it's a, too big a story to tell in any one way. It's too big a cause to describe in any one way. But I think calling those who have expressed the most urgency about the climate crisis doomers is, does a real disservice to them and fundamentally misunderstands the landscape of political opinion that we are navigating. Um, there are some people on like corners of the internet who are doomers, but their numbers are so few. And the number of people who don't care enough are so many. And if turning the dial creates a few more of those people and a lot more and brings a lot more of these people over to the side of climate action, that's personally a rhetorical trade that I'm willing to make. And I think as a movement, um, climate activists should be willing to make that, that move. That all said, um, what does this, this all mean for how we live on this planet? I think it's important to know that expectations for future warming have been cut dramatically over the last five years because of a lot of the, of the developments that I described. Political action, public commitments, investments, rollout of renewables. We now, most analysts think, are heading for something like two and a half, three degrees of warming. Five or 10 years ago, we were talking about four to five degrees of warming. That's a really big difference. It's not enough to save us from the futures that worried us so much in 2018 when the UN came out with their big 1.5 degree report, which kickstarted this political movement, but it's a big improvement. Things have changed for the better. I think that's important to know. I think it's also important to know that even at two, two and a half degrees, the world will go on. People will live their lives, but there will be a lot more suffering. There will be a lot more struggle than was necessary. Um, and you know, anybody who's like heard me talk about the climate crisis like knows what I mean. Like there's a lot of stuff that will happen that will be really, really bad. But also there will be humans navigating that landscape, figuring out what it means to live on that planet, figuring out what obligations we have towards one another in that new world full of that much more suffering. Um, and that's important to keep in mind too. You know, um, this is gonna be very disruptive and burdensome. Um, and there are ways of looking at that set of facts and thinking it signals the end of the world. And there's another way of looking at the same set of facts as um, you know, the natural landscape on which we will erect a human future. And what kind of human future we erect is up to us. And we can probably still engineer a future that is relatively livable, even at two degrees. It will be full of a lot more suffering than we would have had to deal with at 1.5, but it's still possible. And I think falling into a trap of binary thinking about, you know, is this the end of the world and, or isn't it, um, you know, poses the wrong set of questions there because we will be surviving. We will be figuring that out. Um, and we want to feel empowered to do so. And presumably, you know, or at least let, let's say one hopes, um, we will be. <laughs>